We've seen some dark storylines on The Real Housewives. Dungeon Gate on Atlanta and Cancer Gate on OC come to mind. We've even had full seasons that were dark, such as season two of both Beverly Hills and Salt Lake City. But only one entry into The Real Housewives universe has maintained this level of darkness for the full span of the series, and that was The Real Housewives of Vancouver. In this video, I want to dive deep into the murky waters of Vancouver and analyze what worked, what didn't, and look at why it was so dark. Also, since I know people will ask, as of summer 2022, you can watch the show on Hayu if you're outside of the U.S. or Tubi if you're in it. All right, so let's start with some background info, just since I know some of y'all may not have seen the show. The Real Housewives of Vancouver aired on Slice in Canada from April 2012 to April 2013. According to Wikipedia, it aired in Australia and the UK, but didn't ever air in the US. It only ran for two seasons. It was anchored by three housewives who were on both seasons, Jody Clayman, Mary Zilba, and Ronnie Negus. The first season also included Christina Kiesel, who I featured briefly in my One Hit Wonders video, and Reiko McKenzie, both of whom left after the first season. The second season added three wives, Yulia Reynolds, Robin Reichman, and Amanda Hansen. The second season notably didn't have a reunion special. Now, let's start with the factors that made Vancouver unique, paying special attention to the darkness that drove them. The first aspect of Vancouver I want to touch on is the relationship the ladies have to substance abuse and sobriety. This is first featured in season one with Ronnie, who is very clearly in the throes of active alcoholism. We see this first when she meets up with Mary and a friend who are working on an elegant scarf line and Ronnie gets totally blitzed. It's cringy to watch and gets all the worse when she later blames Mary for the incident, setting off one of their very many falling outs. To make matters worse, Ronnie's personal storyline is creating her own wine label, calling it Rehab. I went to rehab. I thought it was wonderful. It was fabulous. The only thing that was missing was happy hour. She reveals she's been to treatment before, so it's clear that this is not a new issue, but something she's struggled with for quite some time. When season two opens up, Ronnie has decided to abstain from drinking, possibly after seeing her behavior in season one, but also because she's had a major family tragedy when her daughter Remy choked on a piece of steak, nearly dying. She's joined by housewife Amanda, who is also recently sober and quite open about her struggles with alcohol. The other ladies have some serious snafus when it comes to being sensitive about addiction. To an alcoholic baby, the vodka doesn't matter. Leading to some awkward moments that aren't all that enjoyable to watch. This focus gets entirely out of hand when Ronnie, who begins drinking again midway through season two, gets super drunk on a boat for her birthday and later accuses fellow housewife Robin of having drugged her. I think this may be a potential cause for the show's axing, as that's a pretty lofty accusation. Which leads us to our next focus, which is low blows. Now, low blows, attacks that go well beneath the bell, are not unique to Vancouver. The ladies go low at some point on every single franchise, but with Vancouver, the magnitude of the blows and the fact that they came from nearly every woman at some point and were just constant made it much more of a presence on this show than any other franchise. The queen of this was Jody, and her target for the most part was Mary Zilba. I'll go a bit more into their dynamic later on in the video, but Jody was just relentless. She was fixated on Mary's alleged plastic surgery, claimed she was dating a 21-year-old, and served her legal documents when Mary said her vintage store sold things secondhand. She constantly was calling her old and attacked her for wearing a midriff-bearing shirt. She called her a general assortment of names, notably in the Alice in Wonderland kombucha tea party where she lost her mind entirely. Look at you! You're a piece of shit, Mary! You don't have fillers in your face! You look like a Martian! So yeah, Jody was just a nightmare. Jody turned on Reiko, who was her ally until a financial conflict came in between the two of them, and yelled across the room that she was cheating on her husband. She also targeted Christina, constantly slut-shaming her, but Christina got the last laugh when she may or may not have slept with Jody's daughter Mia. While I'm team Christina always, it could be considered a bit questionable to seduce your enemy's daughter. Christina also hit Jody where it really hurt, attacking her fashion sense. I hate your f***ing slippers, by the way. Even Mary Zelba, who is positioned as the good girl archetype, got some low blows in. While she made some retaliatory remarks against Jody and Mia, she really went after Ronnie about her drinking constantly. You can't even speak. You've had so much to drink, Ronnie. F*** yourself. I get that it's gotta have worn on her, and Ronnie wasn't very kind to her. I'll go in depth on their dynamic, which is absolutely fascinating shortly, but she would constantly throw Ronnie's addiction in her face, and it was a bit much. Robin also got a few jabs in, though I don't think hers came from as much of a place of coherence and intention, as much as just not thinking about how others might feel about the things she says. The women of Vancouver almost always chose the low road. Even when they make a prank call, the setup is that it's a tax collector coming after Christina for unpaid bills. Christina, yes. this is Brenda calling from Revenue Canada. Do you have a moment? 
My not real conspiracy theory is that they were making an effort to combat the stereotype that Canadians are always nice, and to that, they more than succeeded. One other thing about Vancouver that was kind of strange is that we almost never saw the house husbands. I don't think we even got a peek at Jody's husband, though the two would go through an incredibly acrimonious divorce shortly after the show wrapped, so perhaps that's why. We saw Yulia and Ronnie's husbands, but heard hardly a peep from either of them. The other women were all divorced, though we saw a small bit of Amanda's boyfriend and saw Mary go on a date with a celebrity billionaire in the series finale. While I'm not big on house husbands being super involved in the show, unless of course they're Peter Thomas, Ken Todd, or PK, I think seeing hardly any of them made the women seem less well-rounded. We saw the women with their children from time to time, but it just struck me as odd when I noticed that we never saw the husbands. Another defining feature of Vancouver was an almost complete lack of personal storylines, at least in season two. I never thought I was into seeing the women open a store or start a pop career or whatever, but the fact that season two had almost nothing in the way of the women having their own story arc for the season made me realize that it's needed. We had some in season one, with Ronnie starting her rehab wine label, Jody renovating her store, Reiko doing karate, Christina dating, and Mary recording her hit song Hero, which got played so often that it broke me and was all I listened to for like three days. But with season two, we got some half-hearted attempts that were mostly abandoned. The most substantial one was Amanda creating a kombucha line, but it was really only relevant as it served as her introduction to Jody and was the reason for the epic Alice in Wonderland party. We had some scenes here and there of Yulia becoming an art dealer or whatever, but there wasn't much explanation or real journey with the whole thing, so it didn't land. We had a mini arc of Robin and Mary singing the national anthem at a horse show, but that only took a few episodes. By noticing and missing this aspect of the show, it taught me a bit about storytelling and made me realize that we need some sense of an arc of a journey these women are going on. While the highlight of the show is always the group scenes and the drama, which Vancouver is certainly not lacking in, I think it made it seem like something was a little off. All right, so let's get into my favorite thing to analyze, the dynamics. The first I want to talk about is a relationship I'm so intrigued by, which is the frenemyship of Ronnie and Mary. When the show first opens, the two are close, having been friends for nearly two decades. They explain that they've had some hiccups here and there, but as of now, are good. This immediately crumbles in episode one, when Ronnie meets Jody, who has decided to target Christina and Mary for seemingly no reason, and Ronnie latches on, making digs at Mary in front of all of the women on a cast trip to Whistler. From there, the two are in constant flux, either loving each other and being besties or hating each other. The chaos comes mostly from Ronnie, who seems to flip her allegiance to Mary on a dime. There's one instance in season two where after having been on the outs, the two meet up in Toronto, fight a bit, then decide to make up and be best friends again, throwing Jody into a frenzy when they show up to a group dinner together only for Ronnie to decide the next day that she needs to take a break from Mary. It's incredibly hard to follow what sparks these shifts in her feelings towards Mary, but we do find out in season two that at some point long ago, the two may or may not have slept together, so it could be that their feelings for each other go beyond friendship. Mary denied that this ever happened, but Ronnie was pretty firm in it, so who knows what the truth is. I think there could also be an aspect of Mary knowing a lot of Ronnie's secrets or has seen her at her worst. Given that Mary throws Ronnie's drinking in her face so often, it comes off like she's exasperated with the whole situation. Ronnie also expects Mary to babysit her drinking a bit. The whole friendship is bizarre, but I honestly can't get enough of it. While Jody does her best to get in between it, often reveling and breaking them up, I think the issues between them transcend Jody. Based on a bit of social media sleuthing, it seems as if they've been on and off since the show wrapped as well. But let's talk about another dynamic I can't get enough of, which is that between Jody and Mary. When the show opens, we see Jody call Mary and invite her on a girl's trip to Whistler. Mary seems incredibly apprehensive, signaling that the two have had issues before, but we don't get a great explanation on what exactly they were. I wish we did, because when the group comes together, it's clear that Jody absolutely despises Mary. She begins her attack by demanding that Mary stand up for herself in romantic relationships and lets the world know that she was cheated on. From there, the attacks continue and are relentless. As I mentioned, some of her common charges are that Mary has plastic surgery, is old, and is just generally detestable. She goes out of her way to make Mary suffer, notably organizing a rival dinner party during Mary's birthday in season two, bullying the other women into attending her random dinner, causing nobody but Robin to go to Mary's birthday party. She also makes sure to constantly interfere in Mary and Ronnie's friendship, taking absolute delight in any leverage she has over Mary with Ronnie. By season two, the women can't even be around each other without some massive fight breaking out, and we start to see one or the other not being included in certain events. The line given is that both of them are the issue, but it's clear that Jody is almost always the aggressor. 
At one point, Mary tries to apologize to Jody for whatever she's done that's caused Jody to go completely off the rails at the mere mention of her name, and Jody like cannot compute what's happening. We're never given a sufficient reason for where this hatred stems from, and I'm not really sure that it exists. Part of me wonders if it's just for the show and that Jody knows the best franchises have a Cold War dynamic between the two leads, which is accurate, but the depth of the hatred is so over the top that it seems as if there has to be something more to it. I guess it's within the realm of possibility that there really was some inciting incident that spawned Jody's hatred of Mary and Mary's just a really great actress. It could also be as simple as Jody just being jealous of Mary's talent, beauty, and sweet nature. Though again, the vitriol runs so deep that it seems like there has to be something more. We must last consider that Jody could just take pleasure in terrorizing others and sees Mary as an easy target. I'm not really sure what to think, so if you have a theory, let me know. So let's talk about each lady individually. Let's start with our season one, one season wonders, beginning with Reiko. So Reiko had kind of a cool girl, tough girl vibe. The big defining features about her were her obsession with sports cars and her commitment to martial arts. These two aspects make up the majority of her solo scenes. She also provided the only real shred of diversity as she's half Japanese. She begins the show as Jody's ally. In the first episode, they meet up and it's clear that they know each other at least to some degree. She played ball for Jody's I Hate Mary campaign for a while, not being hateful herself but allowing it to happen and leaving with Jody anytime she dramatically stormed out of a room Mary was in. It wasn't until later in the season when she found out that Jody billed her for the merchant's fees for a purchase that Reiko made at her store when she finally turned on Jody. And as I mentioned earlier, Jody didn't take it well. I thought Reiko was fine, but she was kind of just there. I'm not really into cars, so I wasn't drawn in by that aspect of her, and there wasn't really all that much more she offered on camera. She wasn't really all that close to any of the other women and didn't seem that into the show. She had a cool edgy look and vibe and had a masculine aspect to her we don't often see in Housewives, but I wasn't all that shocked when she didn't return. Let's move on to the other season one girly, Christina Kiesel. I mentioned my adoration for her in my one season wonder list, and when I rewatched the show for this video, my love expanded tenfold. She was the most fun part of the show and also brought a quiet wisdom that you wouldn't necessarily expect from her at first glance. Like I mentioned in my other video, she entered the scene as a Samantha Jones-esque figure, hilariously explaining that she made her fortune by divorcing two very annoying men. I definitely worked hard for my money. She kind of just wanders around partying with her best friend Kevin. She doesn't show up to several on-camera planned meetings with the other housewives, which would be annoying from anyone else, but with Christina, it's kind of awesome and understandable. She did a podcast interview with Mary years after the show wrapped and explained she really didn't know much about the show and she had no idea what she was getting herself into. And honestly, even if she had watched another franchise, I don't think it would be possible to prepare to share a screen with Jody, who initially targeted Christina. Jody made it a point to go out of her way to ensure Christina knew that Jody looked down upon her, but Christina was able to fight off these attacks in a variety of ways. Sometimes, like when Jody and Ronnie went after her for being a self-proclaimed gold digger, she laughed it off and leaned into the joke. Sometimes she got upset and emotional, such as when Jody met her for coffee and proceeded to slut shame her for the duration of their meeting. She would throw little jabs that were honestly very lighthearted, but she'd still apologize for them. She made an effort to reason with Jody and attempted to get to the root of the issue regarding Jody's hatred for Mary. I'm still curious to hear her findings. She also didn't show up to or would leave moments where she was under attack. And finally, when all else failed, she befriended Jody's daughter Mia and spent the night with her, though the details of what exactly happened weren't super clear. Either way, Jody finally left her alone, though it may have been because she fully set her sights on ruining Mary Zilba's life. Christina was a good friend to Mary, and after a few episodes, most of her scenes were with Mary, and they were quite fun to watch together. I thought Christina was a fantastic housewife, providing lighthearted moments in an otherwise heavy, heavy franchise. She was very missed the second season. Let's move on to our season two newbies and end with our core three. Let's start with Yulia, who I think was meant to be Christina's replacement of sorts. Yulia was one of the youngest housewives to ever join the show, being just 26 years old, which was kind of odd as the rest of the women, with the exception of Amanda, were all well into their 40s. Yulia was Russian and would bring up her roots from time to time, especially with regards to vodka. Like I mentioned, she was somewhat involved in the art world, and we'd see it sprinkled in here and there, notably providing her introduction onto the show when she meets Mary. I liked Yulia's boldness and sense of humor. She has a birthday party where she makes a big fuss about her presence and scoffs when the band Ronnie hired to sing for her wouldn't sign her boobs. 
She was also a very hands-off stepmother. The other women are aghast when she had no idea where her young stepdaughter is, and we see her boozing it up with her stepsons, who are just a couple years younger than her. She's also very blunt. One of my favorite examples of this is when she offers her advice to Mary and Robin when they're planning to sing on live TV. She's also not shy to ham it up for the cameras and steal the spotlight, much to Amanda's chagrin. She also acted as a floater in season two, going back and forth between the two warring factions of Mary and Robin versus Jody, Amanda, and usually Ronnie. When she ditches Mary's birthday party for Jody's forced dinner, she feels the heat from the other women and realizes that Jody and the gang don't really like her, they just hate Mary. She also provided some comedy, especially at the Alice in Wonderland party, where the only thing breaking up Jody's screeching is Yulia's commentary on the cake. You look like a cheesy piece of shit. Oh my god, this cake is amazing. I think Yulia had a lot of potential as a housewife, and if the show had continued, I really would have liked to have seen more of her. But let's move on to the woman that Yulia fought the most with, which was Amanda. Amanda is probably my least favorite cast member because she mostly just complained and instigated drama that felt forced and did Jody's bidding. She was explained to us as a friend of Jody's daughter Mia and joined the group when she went to Jody for business advice. She was recently divorced and recently sober. I liked that she was there to talk about her recovery journey as we haven't seen too much of that on The Housewives, but she may have been a little too fresh into it. I found Amanda to be incredibly serious. She often went after Mary, but it seemed to have been mostly at Jody's behest. She also took major umbrage with Yulia, specifically for comments she'd make or for stealing Amanda's spotlight or bikini. I listened to a podcast Amanda did about her recovery journey, and I actually really enjoyed her on there, and she talked about how she kind of changed her vibe from a downtown rocker type of chick to a more traditional glam girl for housewives, so I think that some of the tension within Amanda may have been because she was putting on a front, but I didn't really enjoy what she brought to the show. All right, on to our last one season wonder, which was Robin. So Robin was from Texas and played very heavily into this. She's a certified horse girl and is constantly saying these weird country type of sayings in her confessionals. I'm not sure if she was fed these lines by production or if she really talks like that. She also had major foot and mouth syndrome. She was constantly saying offensive stuff without any awareness that it would bother others. It was mostly funny or would lead to major drama, but some of it was a little uncomfortable when she'd make comments regarding sobriety or alcohol abuse. Even though Robin was a bit unfiltered, she also had a good head on her shoulders and was pretty adept at handling conflict. She initially bonds with Mary over a love of singing and convinces Mary to audition to sing the national anthem with her for a horse show. Now, Mary is a verified recording artist and Robin just sings in the shower, but she's got a pretty good voice. When the two record tapes to send in as an audition, Robin is convinced that Mary's producer warped the recording to make her sound worse than she really did. I'm not sure what the truth really was there, but she didn't let it stop her from getting the gig and becoming quite good friends with Mary. She was very supportive, even when it meant feeling the wrath of Jody and the gang. She also wasn't afraid to stand up for herself, specifically when Ronnie accused Robin of drugging her. Ronnie, along with Robin, got super drunk on a boat for Ronnie's birthday, and rather than owning up to the fact that she was drinking, she accused Robin of something really horrific, and Robin said, no, I'm not going to take it. Even though Robin could sometimes make me cringe a bit, I still really liked her, and she ended up being my favorite of all of the season two newbies by the end of the season. All right, but let's do it. Let's talk about our core three. Let's start with Ronnie. Now, I feel like Ronnie should get some degree of grace, as I really think the show captured her at her worst. She was clearly in the throes of addiction, which she has admitted to since the show wrapped, and with season two was dealing with an incredibly traumatic family situation with her daughter's health crisis after her choking incident. She also seemed to have very complex emotions regarding Mary, and with Jodi constantly in her ear, forcing her around like a pawn in her evil game of chess, we saw her behaving in very perplexing ways. It was hard to track her logical progression through the social dynamics of Vancouver, but maybe she was just as confused as we all were. I do think there was a lot to love about Ronnie. First off, she was incredibly wealthy and gave us a lot of luxury candy. Her house was massive and gorgeous and had a unique vibe that I'm guessing is very Vancouverian, though I've never been there myself, so I don't know. She lived on an island of sorts and would sometimes take a seaplane to get into the city. She would also tell these weird, cryptic, allegorical tales that her interlocutor would often not follow to a comedic effect. Ronnie was kind of a Sisyphus-type character, 
pushing her boulder up the hill to get back to stability and a friendship with Mary and would start to see the light in regards to Jody's evil ways only for Jody to swoop in and knock her back down to the pits of mean girl hell. She'd get back up, start making progress again, then go right back to where she was. It oftentimes wasn't even explained why she was suddenly team Jody again. Even though on the surface I found the whole thing frustrating, there's also a part of me that liked the tug of war game between Jody and Mary for Ronnie's affections. I think if it would have continued on for seasons more, it would have gotten exhausting, but I'd like to think that she'd eventually have picked Elaine. On to the stars of the show, Mary and Jody. Let's save Jody for last. So Mary Zelba was set up as the protagonist of the show and had this hyper good girl aspect about her. She has a very youthful, kind of animated type of look to her and is a bit more soft-spoken than a lead of one of these shows typically is. She came in telling us that she was a pop star in her former life living in America before she gave it all up for a life living as a Canadian mother and housewife. But now that she's divorced, she wants to be back in the spotlight. She does genuinely have a fantastic singing voice, and I enjoyed seeing the process of her recording the song that was played over and over and over again on the show called Hero. We also got to see her record a music video in double speed, which was kind of funny, and saw her journey singing on live TV with Robin as her backup. I think that because she was so aggressively propped up as the good guy, it kind of made me not trust her a bit. I don't think she's a bad person by any means, rather a very nice and kind person, but the image she presented was so squeaky clean that it makes you kind of look for cracks. An obvious one was when she blatantly lied multiple times at one dinner in an attempt to leave an uncomfortable situation. She gets a phone call Heather Dubrow style saying that the child of her non-housewife BFF has been run over by a car. That's pretty alarming, obviously, so when Yulia, who is also friends with the non-housewife, calls her to get the story, it turns out that he had just hurt his foot and it looks like it had been run over by a car. The women are busy processing this when Mary suddenly is alerted to the fact that her teenage sons are throwing a party at her condo and she has to rush home to break it up. Mary exits, though the women spot her having a drink at the restaurant literally next door. She then explains that the party wasn't that crazy and she had to have a drink to unwind a bit. It's just kind of strange and she did a terrible job covering the tracks of these bizarre lives when she could have just said that Jody is a nightmare to be around and she's leaving. Other than that, the only real big grievance with Mary is her main character type of energy, specifically with her ally Robin, whom she subtly puts down in regard to her singing. I get that singing is kind of Mary's thing, but Robin just wanted to have some fun and Mary ensured that Robin knew she was purely backup. White lies and wanting attention are very mild sins, and, and I do think Mary was a good housewife. She was put through hell constantly on the show, and I like seeing her attempt to handle the crazy attacks that came from Jody. Mary was different from most other housewives, but I enjoyed her, and had the show remained on the air, I can see her being the last OG standing without a doubt. But let's finish with the marvel that is Jody Clayman. Jody is rare in that I wish she would have given us a bit less, because she could have been absolutely iconic and the true star of the show if she could have just turned the nastiness down by three or four decibels. She looked the part of a villain like no other. She was always donned in fur and massive sunglasses, which caused conflict multiple times when she refused to take them off. She was good at gathering minions, her most loyal being her daughter Mia, who is spiritually a housewife just as much as any of the other women. The two dragging their oodles of Louis Vuitton luggage on a quick cash trip will forever live in my mind. She had funny confessionals and spoke in the most campy, evil cadence. She was absolutely gleeful anytime she got ammo on another housewife. She was also a straight-up Disney villain, reaching her apex in the series finale when she naturally dressed as the Red Queen to Amanda's Alice in Wonderland party. She insisted to Ronnie that she was her best friend, despite constantly interfering in her life and friendship with Mary. Even with the devastatingly low blows and constant character attacks against the other women, there's a part of me that still loves to watch her. She's got a kind of glamour that draws me to her. She's also got a hyper femininity with her baking and her store and her motherly side that gives her some dimension. She could have been the greatest villain of all time and perhaps just might be, but the nastiness that bled off of the show just gives her a bit of an ick factor. I'll put a Where Are They Now article in the description of this video if you want to see how life caught up to her. Alright, so I felt like I needed to give some closure on why the show was cancelled, but I honestly cannot find a legitimate reason. The ratings were phenomenal, even record-breaking. The show was good. Even if the first season was better than the second, it's not like the second season was cancel-worthy, and I think they had a great core to continue to build upon. The network said that they wanted to focus on scripted content, but when I looked at the Wikipedia page with their past and current content, it's nearly all unscripted. I don't live in Canada, so I have no real understanding of the network, so if anyone watching this video has better insight into the possible psyche of the Slice network, please leave a comment and let me in. 
I have to wonder if it's due to all the nastiness and legal issues the women were raising. Jody sued Mary at some point for speaking about something very dark, but it happened over a year after the show ended, so that's obviously not the cause. I found a post on Reddit with a link to a blog on the real reason the show was canceled, but the link's broken so I don't know what it said, but all the comments are talking about Jody being either awful or iconic without openly restating what the blog said. It's truly a mystery to me why this show ended so abruptly. I'd love to hear any theories you have. So I want to end this thing by imploring you all to either watch or rewatch The Real Housewives of Vancouver. No Real Housewives entry has the amount of psychological warfare and intrigue as this one does. No show has a relationship with as much delicacy as that between Ronnie and Mary, besides perhaps the messy triangle the Richard sisters bring us on Beverly Hills. No villain vills the way Jody does. Yolanda Hadid could never horse girl the way Robin does. If you want more of the messy, disturbing sobriety story of Kim Richards, watch Vancouver. If you want spectacular views that rival Salt Lake City, see our sisters to the north. Honestly, Vancouver is super underrated, and now that it's available for Americans to watch for free, head over to Tubi. If you have access to Hayu, which is honestly the streaming site dreams are made of for a girl like me, ignore all others and watch Vancouver. Plus, the word on the street is that the ladies are reuniting for a 10-year anniversary special in July of 2022. Once it comes out, I'll do my best to link how to watch it in the comments or description. So if you're watching this in the far future, head there if you want more Vancouver. All right, my dears, you know the drill. Like this video so the algorithm spreads the good word of the Real Housewives of Vancouver and subscribe to the channel if you're a housewives lover like I am. Also comment all of your thoughts on Vancouver below and if you want more analysis, people usually leave some fantastic stuff in the comments. I'm always eager to hear other people's thoughts and really love reading what other people think about my beloved shows. If you wanna connect on social media, my ads for Twitter and Instagram are both at Deeply Super Fish. You can also probably get clues for future videos on there as well. But for now, I will eagerly await seeing you in the next video. Bye!